Oh, please, please. Well, Mr. Sure. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it's an immense pleasure for me to be here. I'm overwhelmed almost by what uh, you, Mr. President Miguel, have said about me. I, I wish I could live up to all the wonderful things that you've uh, outlined. But it is indeed an immense pleasure. I, I think that Madrid, and my wife agrees with me, is one of the most beautiful cities that one could meet and visit. And we've had a wonderful time in the very short period that we've been here. In the Prado this morning, it's absolutely exhilarating. There are friends in the audience uh, whom I'm so pleased to see again, whom I've collaborated with. And what I plan to do today is something which has to be rather superficial. And the subject itself is immense. Each one of the words there, you know, green chemistry, clean technology and sustainability. Sustainability, so somebody told me recently in the Wikipedia, has over a hundred distinct definitions. <laughs> now, I'm not going to chase the precise meaning of that. It's pretty well obvious to you, although I shall outline some very famous definitions, one given by Thomas Jefferson, which is in the abstract. But I would like to say that it is a topic that elicits comment and judgment from not only physical, biological, medical, and other scientists, social scientists, it also is of considerable interest to the economists and to the politicians. There is a wonderful book written by the chief scientific advisor to the British uh, Department of Energy and Climate Change. He's a Cavendish University professor of physics, David Mackay, and it's available free on the internet. It's called Sustainability Without the Hot Air, and it's a marvelous analysis. One always needs a physicist to do the quantifications. You know, one can talk about solar energy, or one can talk about wind energy, the harnessing of tidal power and so forth. This man puts it in perfect context and tells you if you do the entire sum of energy in, energy out, there are some propositions which, although popular, like wind energy, for example, are not really anything like as important if you do the total assessment of the costs, etc., and the necessary thermodynamics. Nothing like as important as, say, uh, well, fuel based, whether it's from fossil fuel, or whether it's from sustainable materials, from plants and so on. The energy density, that's an important concept. And people don't even mention it too often. But we all talk in Britain these days about having electrical cars, electrically driven cars and batteries. Now the energy density of a battery is about 0.5 of a megajoule per kilogram. The energy density of a hydrogen molecule is 140 megajoules per kilogram. And if you talk about fossil fuels and other fuels like, you know, petroleum, that's 10 to the 2, 100 times more in energy density rather than power density of uh, uh, the battery power. Now, again, Green chemistry, well, what do we mean by that? Again, scientists of all persuasions and, and, uh, and, uh, pers uh, and expertise contribute to this. The main thing that one wants to talk about in green chemistry is to be able to do things in a very responsible way, not to use solvents, not to use reagents which generate salts that have to be disposed of, to minimize waste production, eliminate it if possible, to carry out reactions which are atom efficient, utilize all the reactants to give you the product that you desire, to be able to handle biomass, which is sustainable, and to do it in an environmentally responsible manner. These things are so obvious that it's almost platitudinous to repeat them. But nevertheless, this is what it means. And likewise, clean technology. I mean, just to give it in one sentence, don't use concentrated nitric acid 
as your oxidant, if you can devise a way using catalysis to oxidize using air or oxygen. When one produces adipic acid, which is the sort of building block to nylon, nylon 66, and it's used for many other purposes, it generally starts these days using cyclohexane, which starts from benzene, which comes from fossil fuels. Then you oxidize it with concentrated nitric acid. Now that generates a vast quantity of nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So one needs to circumvent that method, and in future, one obviously will have to move away from that. So that's an example of clean technology, so to speak. Now catalysis, the subject is of perennial interest and eternally new and fascinating in its multidimensional nature. You can have biocatalysts, enzymes, or microbes that you can manipulate genetically and otherwise. Now, enzymes carry out some reactions fantastically specifically with tremendous high efficiency. However, some of them are very expensive, and some of them have to be purified. You know, these days in America, something like 10 million tons of fractose is used in the mineral drinks industry. It's isomerization of glucose. And the enzyme that's used for that is xylose isomerase. That, isom that enzyme has to be handled in a very pure form. You've got to get rid of all calcium and so forth. So this is expensive. So there are now methods using inorganic catalysts to displace biocatalysts. There are other situations where biocatalysts are vastly superior to inorganic catalysts. It depends on what particular situation that you're concerned with. And there are two other types of catalysts which I should, for the sake of completeness, mention very, almost subliminally, as it were. Number one, the homogeneous catalyst. Now, the homogeneous catalysis, there are experts in the audience here, the great thing there is you can employ dexterous methods of manipulating the catalyst, just effect minor changes so as to incredibly improve the performance of that catalyst. In fact, we know far more about homogeneous catalysts, partly because the techniques of studying them uh, are such that you, know, you can handle the molecule that does all the work, or the substance that does all the work, in an in situ manner, under operational conditions. The disadvantage with homogeneous catalysts is that it is involved in the process of converting the reactant to the product, and it has to be, therefore, separated. There are ways around that, but it is the disadvantage. Heterogeneous catalysts, typically a solid, will cause a reaction between two liquids, shall we say, or a solid and a gas, or a liquid and a gas, or whatever. The fact that the catalyst is solid means that you can readily filter the product from the reactant, and you can recycle it. There are experts in this audience, and there are experts all over Spain. I, I'm almost too ashamed to mention these puerile matters in the presence of people who know many of them far more than I do about all this. So now I judged it, Mr. President, because you gave me this title, or at least part of the title. Uh, I'm not sure if I'd have chosen it myself, but you've done me a great favor because you've compelled me to rethink where I stand on many of these things. But life is short, and I have to rely on certain facts which I know to be true, and some of those I've tested, and many of them are my own items of work. So I have to ask you, I'm giving you a health warning, as it were, at the commencement of this lecture, that much of what I say is subjective and personal. Uh, necessarily, that is so. It's not all embracing comprehensive and clinically objective. Uh, that, I beg your indulgence, but nevertheless, I hope I can make it interesting. Well, Thomas Jefferson was one of the first people to come up with this wonderful definition. 
Uh, as I said to you, there are over a hundred of them. Remember the president or the prime minister of Norway, Greta Butland, she came out, she was very prominent in European discussions. But as I was telling you also, David Mackay's book, Sustainability Without the Hot Air, is an extremely, extremely important document. And you can have it free, which is one of the nice things. Well now, science, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, in conjunction with the Women in Science initiative set up uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and supported by UNESCO and L'Oreal, they have come out with a wonderful booklet from which I've taken this and the next three slides just to remind you how they perceive sustainability. And this, this is a document that is sent to pretty well all the secondary schools of the world. That's the aim of UNESCO in pronouncing this document. It's available also uh, on the net. What is green medicine? Preserving biodiversity starts with cataloging of regional plants and their uses. You know, herbal medicine, many of which, of course, is controversial, but much of it is absolutely proven. Chinese medicine, for example. But not just only Chinese, all over the world. There are medical cures which rely on using the right plants and taking the right extracts. Environmental responsibility. Well, it's what the Americans would call milk and motherhood statements, you know. There's nothing very romantic and very phenomenally uh, urgent and important about this, except in as much as it is indeed vital for mankind to take on this responsibility of protecting the environment and doing all that he or she can to ensure that one lives in a sustainable way. Now, I put this slide in, which is a relatively recent one, because it illustrates immediately the kind of controversy that crops up when people start talking about such things as bioethanol. Now, you can put in very many comments about bioethanol. First of all, you know, the American drive for bioethanol, which started about six or ten years ago, was driven very largely by the political desire to uh, release, relieve them of the necessity to import oil from the Middle East. Politically inflammable area, and they just wanted to be self-sustaining. Well, now you can, of course, from corn and from many other plants, produce ethanol. There's a glut of bioethanol in America. Far too many people did it. You know, now people are wondering, what should we do with the surplus ethanol? And when you look at the analysis, there are many comments that become relevant. Number one, uh, if you use up a large land mass to grow material the principal purpose of which is to generate fuel, either bioethanol or diesel, and I'll come to that. And Avelino Corma, who is sitting in the audience, has written extensively and carried out much precise and pioneering work in the whole technique of converting biomass into various kinds of fuels, not just jet fuel, but uh, diesel and gasoline and other kinds. But look, there's a controversy, you see. This is the statement, it's the open society. There is no way to protect food from corn crops, from contamination by ethanol corn. There's, the debate is still raging in very, very active form all over the world. But the other comment that is worth making at this stage is, instead of perhaps using land mass, one should use uh, water, even sea shores and brackish water, and in fact cultivate the right algae so that you can then, by genetic manipulation, pursue the photochemical reaction of converting carbon dioxide and water directly into ethanol. There are many companies all over the world that aim to do that. There's a company which is based in uh, Georgia Tech and in Florida called Alginol, 
and uh, Professor Marita uh, Valge knows very well a gentleman who is concerned with converting those algae in a very efficient way to give the necessary fuel, ethanol if you wish, but you can produce whatever you wish. Well, <clears throat> miscanthus is not the name of this lady. It's the type of uh, grass that grows to a very, very high altitude, 12 feet in a very short time. In uh, the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, they have fields of different kinds of switchgrass and various other grasses that grow at phenomenal rates because they want to be concerned with harnessing biomass in an efficient, effective way so as to produce not just fuel, but chemicals of other kinds. In fact, even since being in Madrid, I saw on BBC World last night an advert from either Tennessee or Kentucky where they were boasting how much they are already producing uh, in that state, whichever one it was, I've forgotten already, uh, bioethanol from the grass that they grow there. Well, with this kind of background, this is a pretty simple-minded view, you need better catalysts to dehydrate the carbohydrates and the various oxy-functionalized materials that are the constituents of the growing live world, as it were. You need to be able to dehydroxylate, to reduce, to uh, then take, you know, they're heavily functionalized. You might pyrolyze in an efficient way. There are methods of doing that. There have got to be ways of taking not just cellulosic or hemicellulosic or lignin material. In biomass, there are sort of broad, three broad categories. The cellulose is straightforward to handle. Uh, the hemicellulose is not quite so easy, but it can be done. The lignin, however, is much more recalcitrant. However, much work is being done, and I'll mention a, a paper that's come out in science in the last uh, month or so, which tells you how to uh, split an aromatic oxygen ether bond, which is the key material that is in the presence of, or in the material of lignin. Now, this is a slide which I borrowed from uh, Klaus Christensen of the Danish uh, Technical University when I lectured there two or three years ago. Uh, it's very interesting. What he's done is take ordinary fossil fuels, coal or natural gas, and he's drawn a line, as it were, that mark out the various products that one wants and they're very big. I mean, you see methanol is used extensively, diesel and benzene, terephthalic acid is used in all sorts of fabrics and so forth. I mean, catalysts are needed for all sorts of things, fragrances, uh, flavors, fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, fabrics, and so on. You need catalysts for all those things, and they handle and produce many of the materials that you see here. But what Christensen did was to point out that you can get all these materials quite readily uh, from biomass. You don't have to start with coal or with um, oil or, or natural gas. And there's this interesting C factor, which is the amount of CO2 produced per kilogram of desired product. And also this plot, again, is, illustrates the economics of how things change, the price of corn uh, as against <coughs> the price of oil. Look at the fluctuations in it in the passage of 80 years or so. Renewable chemical industry, and this is the fossil sources. There are only about nine or 10 materials that you really must have to drive the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry, to produce all these things, that for photography, this for apparel, this for various growth things, antifreeze, various other things. All these materials can, in fact, be produced from renewable chemicals using a multiplicity of different techniques. Now, there's a lady in California Institute of Technology who has been pursuing the line of Darwinian evolution of enzymes. And it's very elegant work. It's work that's also been done beautifully and independently 
by Manfred Reitz in uh, Mülheim in Germany. Uh, but I take this from uh, Frances Arnold's, one of her papers. Look, it's worth reading, quite apart from the subtle and comprehensive changes that we may be made to the amino acid sequence in more or less any protein by the process of cytoelectric mutagenesis. That, that's a Nobel Prize winning invention of Michael Smith of about 20 years ago. There are other ways of developing powerful enzyme catalysts, and perhaps the most important of these is Darwinian evolution. You fast forward Darwin's evolutionary methods or evolutionary identity. <clears throat> In effect, the ethos behind this approach is based on the fact that since one does not really know what sequence of amino acids will confer the required catalytic activity and seal activity, it is best instead to breed the proteins by forced evolution so as to achieve novel and desirable functions. And what, this is what she said. This approach circumvents our profound ignorance of how the amino acid sequence encodes protein function and exploits the ability of biological systems to evolve and innovate. Structure-guided recombination of homologous proteins generates libraries. You can produce 10,000 different possible enzymes in one day. That's the sort of thing that, for example, Manfred Reitz is doing in Germany. And then you pick out <coughs> the one best suited for the purpose that you have in hand. Here's an example. I'll just deal with this part. This is joint work by Arnold and this gentleman at UCLA. Instead of letting the normal isomerization process with Escherichia coli from glucose to go on to various other products, you can hijack the process and let it form isobutanol, which is an extremely good substitute for gasoline. Very high octane number and so forth. Doesn't corrode the tank, etc. And this is now being produced in Colorado uh, by a company that is uh, being set up by these people. <coughs> now, here's just two other examples, of which there could be many, and there will be many that I'll pursue in a short while. This was an article written in Nature five years or so ago, pointing out that you can start with starch, which is abundant material. You can heat it and do it in a very care careful way, produce synthesis gas, and you get all the necessary products that you know you can prepare, including gasoline and various other things. <clears throat> Either you can use enzymes, microorganisms, or you can do things in a slightly different way. Now, here's another set based on gamma valar electron economy, you see. This is a work that's been described in several places. This Hungarian worker is where I've taken this particular one from. Now, here's a collaborator of Avellino, and uh, this shows you a very quick subliminal way. Cellulosic mass, you can gasify it, you get all these. You can pyrolyze it, you can hydrolyze it. Look at all the products. This is Avellino's own work, taking fatty acids. There are a thousand different fatty acids in nature, but only about ten of them are really important. Right? Now, Playing an appropriate game and developing, as was done in Valencia by this team, you can have a catalyst that produces these desirable lubricants, diesels, chemicals, etc. There's another of uh, Avellino's articles which I feel I should mention. The aerobic oxidation of hydroxyvisophora. This is so easy to prepare, but you now can introduce an inorganic a catalyst, an immobilized vanadyl pyridine. This is where your chemical know-how comes into the fore. And you can support that. Look what you can do. You can obtain by aerobic oxidation. You remember what I said at the beginning? That you don't have to start with very environmentally aggressive uh, oxidants. Now, my own work has for many years been focused on nanoporous solids of which there are two main kinds. 
There are those that are beautifully ordered, the kind of micrographs that uh, Jose um, Gonzalez Calbe used to take when he worked with me in Cambridge, and many of the beautiful micrographs that you, Mr. President, have been producing on various other solids that are of vital importance in the context of superconductivity and so forth. These are ordered nanoporous, but what you might call the microporous solids. You can put many different types of atoms in. Uh, tin is uh, there. That tin has turned out to be an extremely important constituent of many of these uh, either naturally occurring or synthesized. Zeolite beta, for example, is not listed there. But tin in zeolite beta can do marvelous things. Uh, the mesoporous silicas, which have only been on the scene uh, since about 1992, uh, uh, from work that was done in the United States, these are ordered open structures, but there's no crystallographic order in the actual framework in the material of the, itself. It's atomically disordered. This is an excerpt from a, a tomogram. And, but those, those diameters there, you see, are roughly about 30 to 40 angstrom units. And you can put some quite big molecules, the kind of organometallic molecules that uh, um, people in Zaragoza and other places have been using uh, in their own catalytic studies. Well, look, theoretically, this is a paper which uh, Jacek Klinowski and I published uh, some years ago. Uh, pointing out how many theoretically possible open structures there are. And it's innumerable. It's colossal. Look, look, this is the rate at which new materials of a mesoporous kind that are theoretically possible, whether you can actually form all of them is also uh, another matter. But this is how microporous zeolites, known zeolites, you know, when I started imaging zeolites in 1979, 1980, there were only about 50 of them known at that time. Now it's up to 190 or so. And there's still regularly new ones being discovered, many of them in Valencia, uh, at a rate of about five or 10 new ones every year. Now here are just three. <clears throat> this one, came from the Union Carbide Laboratories in America. And it's an extremely important catalyst. It's called silico aluminophosphate, number 34 in their series. Uh, you can see the color code, right? The silicon is uh, yellow, oxygen is red. These are acid sites, because by replacing a phosphorus with silicon, you generate an acid site. Now, you can do that in other ways, too. You can replace uh, an aluminum by a magnesium or a zinc or a cobalt. That's usually three-valent. These are two-valent. So you can have an acid in this way. Now, these are all single-site catalysts. They're solid acid catalysts. This one is Davy Faraday, number four, the Davy Faraday lab in the Royal Institution, which you, Mr. President, kindly mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Now, <clears throat> the point I'm making is there is abundant scope with materials of this kind to play tunes delicately to arrive at highly selective and highly active catalysts. This is a paper which we've not yet written, but it should have been. You take bioethanol, for example, and you can dehydrate it with any one of those three examples that I mentioned. Now, when this slide was made, which is about two years ago, the yields were no more than 70%. Now they're much higher, and selectivity of 100%. Now, getting ethylene this way is a much better proposition. It's a cleaner, greener, more sustainable way of doing things. And why is ethylene? Well, you'd all know about packaging, polyethylene. You can't live in the modern age without polythene. But polypropylene is even more important. And I'll go on to this in a few minutes. Let me just uh, mention a few nice things that you can do with shape selectivity. You see, normally, when one was taught 
organic chemistry in the laboratory as a university student, you always used concentrated acid and you formed a NO2 plus. And now you can do it much more benignly without any solvent and you capitalize on the shape selectivity of this zeolite beta. And this is work that is uh, very important in the pharmaceutical industry and in general when you're producing fine chemicals. Now, here's an example of what is known as an unclean technological process. It's the production of caprolactam, which is the precursor of nylon-6. If you heat nyl uh, caprolactam, it's nylon-6. Now, nylon-6 is a massive product. And you can't have modern civilized life without nylon. You know, you use it for wear, you use it for all sorts of medical purposes, for carpets, for in innumerable outlets. Now, the way it's produced, very largely, is to start from benzene and then convert it to cyclohexanone, and then to use this aggressive hydroxylamine in the presence of ammonia, and you form this oxime intermediate. But note that by doing that, you generate ammonium sulfate. Now the next job is to isomerize the oxime into this caprolactam. It's the classic Beckman rearrangement. Look what you have to have, oleum and sulfuric acid. Now, this hydroxylamine sulfate is a capriciously explosive material. When my colleague and I, Dr. Robert Raja, looked at this, we thought, well, we are not aiming to replace the industrial process in one fell swoop, as it were, but we want to think of a method which is much more economical, much cleaner, much safer, and single step, solvent free, and you don't generate, you know, four times as much caprolactam is formed as ammonium sulfate. So this is a byproduct of the production of ammonium sulfate, which has got very little use. It's a very low grade fertilizer. So what we did was to work out a method whereby you could generate the hydroxylamine in situ by taking ammonia and air and designing this catalyst, which is a single site catalyst, you can generate in situ the hydroxylamine. Now that gets rid of all transportation problems. You produce the explosive and oxidizing material on site, as it were, inside this little nano reactor, catalytic reactor. And the catalytically active sites are all there you generate the oxime, and the acid is there to convert it to the caprolactam. So you can do it all in one go. We had first tested that in principle about 10 years ago. So here it is. This is the story. Look, nylon. This is, these are the uses of nylon. You can't imagine civilized life without having nylon-6. And the good thing about nylon-6, unlike other types of nylon, is that you can readily uh, recycle it. <coughs> now, remember my talking about adipic acid? Adipic acid starts from cyclohexane. This is how it's done industrially by the British Petroleum Company and many other companies. You have a mixture of homogeneous catalysts, heterogeneous catalysts, multi-step process, very demanding, I nitric acid, you produce vast quantities of nitrous oxide and CO2. Uh, one of them, of course, is a greenhouse, well, both are greenhouse gases, but one also has an adverse effect on the, uh, on the ozone layer. So this is the product, and that's how it's done. Now, just to demonstrate that there's a much easier way of doing this, if you design the nanoporous catalyst, you can get with this active site, which we chose with care, you can produce 65% of the conversion. It gives you a dipic acid, and that's solvent-free, 
and it's with air. So that's why I talk about clean technology. Well, I'm going to gallop through the remainder of the lecture, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, and Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I just want to whisk before you, as it were, some illustrative examples. This, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. This uh, Danish group again, you see, they convert sugars to lactic acid. Now, man, lactic acid can be a good polymeric material for use for a multiplicity of purposes, but it doesn't have to come from fossil fuels. It comes from plants. Uh, and this is very nice work being done in uh, the suburbs of Copenhagen. Now, glucose going to fructose, this is, um, you know, corn syrup, uh, high fructose corn syrup, as I was telling you, about 10 million tons a year in the U.S. alone is produced of this material from glucose. They do it at present using enzymes. But there's a way of doing it by using a, 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 a zeolite with tin in it as an active center, single site. And you can do that under conditions which are much more robust. They don't require very clinical and very uh, careful purification of the enzyme. I'll go quickly through this one. <clears throat> Muconic acid is something you can prepare from corn very readily by biocatalysis. Uh, some years ago, eight years ago, we found by judicious planning a chemical, a, a catalyst, which is a bimetallic catalyst that produces adipic acid just by hydrogenation of this raw material. So again, the editor of Science that year, in May of that year, talked about, uh, well, it identified this paper as a, a very nice contribution to sort of clean and green chemistry because it did away with uh, uh, all the other methods of dirt and, and, and uh, uh, it, well, byproducts which were unwanted and dangerous. This is a material which, I, uh, the purpose of showing you this is simply to point out that whereas the platinum group metals uh, play a huge role, platinum, uh, palladium, and ruthenium in converting, hydrogenating raw materials to give you products that are extremely important, we have found that by doctoring the catalyst with tin, and tin is much, much cheaper, it can carry out very efficient reactions. Here are some products again. It's from an old table published eight years ago. All these things have come from the use of nano-cluster catalysts inside a nanoporous solid, very highly active. Here's an illustration of them. You see, this is uh, the way we, we can determine the structure using X-ray absorption, fine structure, and a combination of high-angle annular dark field electron microscopy, which is of great interest to people in uh, Madrid. Uh, and he has a, another example of the, of the actual chemistry and physical chemistry involved in actually arriving at a cluster which you have a structure of that kind. It's an extremely arduous task to determine the precise location of the four copper and 12 ruthenium and two carbon atoms. Uh, that's a, almost a, a year's work of uh, combined X-ray absorption fine structure on the copper and ruthenium edge, then some density functional and molecular mechanics and various other techniques. Now, there's a very interesting study that has been published uh, by a joint uh, Wisconsin and Tufts University, uh, Maria Flitzani Stephanopoulos. Uh, she described part of this in the Salamanca conference that Avelino Corma had organized nearly, nearly two years ago, or was it exactly two years ago? And this is, a, I found it very important. The paper came out in science a little later. You just have to have platinum, one single platinum, surrounded by six potassiums and a few hydroxyls, and you then carry out the water-gas shift reaction. 
In other words, you convert um, CO2 and water into hydrogen. Now, of course, there's a problem of uh, generating CO2 when you do that. But this is a very viable method of generating hydrogen on board fuel cell-driven cars. And that's one of the main interests in it. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is work that Avelino Corma and I, and one of his students who came to the Royal Institution, um, Dr. Fernando Rey, uh, and Thomas Marshmeyer, who is now Professor of Sustainable Chemistry and Catalysis in the University of Sydney. It's a rather uh, a complicated slide, but it just shows you a few illustrative things. You harness the nanospace of nanoporous materials. <clears throat> you put in a bulky organometallic molecule. It's titanosine dichloride. You put in a small amount of amine. You wean away <clears throat> the chlorines. You end up with an active site. Now, you do that so carefully, and because of the cyclopentadienyl rings, you space out the active centers. They're single sites, and they're separate from one another. This is a very, very efficient catalyst. And the team in Milan, um, Guidotti, Matteo Guidotti and his team have utilized this in a very extensive way. They're still publishing on it, converting <coughs> fatty acid methyl esters to ethers. This is the way in which it goes. You know, you have an active site. Here's the active site, titan oil. In comes the hydroperoxide. In comes the reagent which is an alkene, it plucks off an oxygen, and it's self-sustaining. That's cat catalysis in action. So this is what Guidotti and others are doing. And these are extremely useful products which they can produce from these naturally occurring fatty acid esters. Now, one of the papers in Salamanca which caught my eye, and which I thought was one of the most interesting that I heard there, was the work of this Japanese worker Iwamoto. I told you there's plenty of ethylene needed for polythene, but there's even more demand for propylene. I mean, you wouldn't have these bins all over the world unless you had plenty of propylene to make rigid containers of that kind. How do you get the propylene? Well, there are several ways of doing it, but this is a very attractive way. You take the ethylene and you design a tri-functional catalyst. You have one active center that causes dimerization. You have another active center that isomerizes, and another active center which does metathesis, and you end up with propylene. Now, that's not a bad story, you see. Look, I mean, conversions are not huge, but they're 50% or so, and that's, uh, I gather, potentially something that Japanese industry is now exploiting. Well, very, very quickly, I just want to show that you can harness nanospace by playing tricks with chiral ligands of the kind that organometallics use, medic experts use. And by doing that, you can carry out asymmetric conversions. There are several ways in which you can do that. Homogeneously, it's a very popular way of doing it, but you do suffer the disadvantage of having the product mingled with the catalyst. By doing it in this way, uh, and I don't want to go into the labyrinthine detail, but we were able to compare, for example, a homogeneous catalyst with a heterogeneous catalyst with exactly the same active site. And therefore, you can make a really wonderful academic comparison of a heterogeneous catalyst with a homogeneous catalyst. And you can see how the influence of the spatial confinement uh, it has on the production of an enantioselective product. That's now one of the last things I want to mention, and you, Mr. President, talked about the ethyl uh, acetate production. That work came out of uh, a collaboration which I had with the University of Swansea with the late uh, Howard Purnell and uh, 
and, and uh, Jim Ballantyne when we looked at all the vast sweep of clays and of course there's been a big contribution. If you remember you sent me when I came uh, with my late wife in uh, I think it was about 1993 and I went from Granada to Seville and so forth and there was a big team on, uh, on clay, uh, yes. Garcia, I forgot, forgot. That's right, that's right. Well, I was <coughs> preoccupied at that time by clays and what you can do with them. And of course, the nice thing is you can synthesize these very easily and they're pure. If you take them from nature, they often contain disastrous impurities, you see, like iron and vanadium and so on. But you can synthesize them. And by synthesize them, then you can pillar them. And you can functionalize those pillars. Well, that's how we tumbled. We took out a patent, which I foolishly sold for one penny to the British Praetorium Company. But they gave me two postdoctoral fellowships every year for 10 years, so I can't complain. Right? However, it is the basis of the production of something like 350,000 tons a year. You have a solid acid, and you have acetic, glacial acetic acid, and ethylene. And they just form an addition reaction. It's a 100% atom efficient reaction, and it forms ethyl acetate. The normal method of producing is to take acetic, is to take um, uh, ethylene and uh, sulf sulfuric acid. And then you have to have a process of uh, separating, it's a two step process, and separating the water. This is one of the letters that Michael Faraday received in 1842 from W.R. Grove the man who invented the fuel cell. And W.R. Grove was from Swansea. I don't know if you realize that, yeah. He did his early work in Swansea. But, you know, he was a judge. He was a lawyer. But his real love was electrochemistry. And every time he made enough money, he used to stop being a judge or a, a solicitor or whatever and start doing work. And he had a laboratory in the London Institution, which is now no longer exists. My dear sir, this is what he says, right? I've just completed a curious voltaic pile, which I think you would like to see. It is composed of alternate tubes of oxygen and hydrogen, through each of which passes plates of platina, platina foil, so as to dip into separate vessels of water acidulated with sulfuric acid, the liquid just touching the extremities of the foil, as in the rough figure below. Well, that is the fuel cell, the first ever fuel cell. You take, you know, you get, uh, instead of burning hydrogen and oxygen in an explosive way, you burn them electrochemically and you generate electricity. Well, the fuel cell has given rise, you know, I, with others, visit the UNICAT fantastically big organization in Berlin where they have three uh, Max Planck Institutes and four universities all studying catalysis and they write reports periodically. Now this was one of the reports and it's rather nice but I have to be honest and I know Fraser Armstrong quite well right he's a very good inorganic chemist working with Peter Edwards a mutual friend a miniature model of a biological fuel cell has already been developed. You take an enzymatic fuel cell. Well, now, if you do the analysis, you remember Robert Schlegel, I'm sure. Robert Schlegel has done the analysis. I mean, it's highly unlikely that the enzyme fuel cell is going to contribute. This is where you need the physicist to come in and say, look, do the sums, right? How many enzymes will you need, right? I mean, you'd have to cover the surface of the Earth with this, this particular enzyme. And you see, better than platinum. You see, this is all the razzmatazz that you, well, most people indulge in it. This is, unfortunately, the way an open society involves, evolves when it seeks to get uh, funding. I won't deal with that, but I will deal with this, this last one. This is an excerpt 
from a paper that came from Massachusetts Institute of Technology by a man whom I don't personally know, but whose work I much admire, Nocera. He's all in favor of harnessing solar energy, not in the way that most people want it by photovoltaics and so forth, although clearly the house of the future will have photovoltaics, which will generate enough electricity to electrolyze water, which then produces hydrogen and oxygen and a fuel cell, which then you can use to drive your car. The point is, he makes the assessment, he's a very good physical chemist. The average household in America requires 20 kilowatt hours per day. You can easily, now he's done some very good inorganic chemistry. Instead of working through the photovoltaic route, he's designed a catalyst, which is a copper, a cobalt phosphate which is an oxygen evolving catalyst, which can take sunlight and generate through this multi-electron process using the techniques which he has described in a detailed paper in inorganic chemistry less than a year ago. And I found it very convincing. I'd like to look more into it. He's published many more papers than I've had time to read. But this, I think, is a viable way of generating personal energy. This would be applicable with a, a good catalyst that is cheap. You know, cobalt and phosphorus and phosphates are abundant in the earth, right? It's nothing fancy. You don't have to, you know, cadmium telluride or something like that, you see. And you can generate from rather dirty water and at a variety of pHs, because to do a electrolysis effectively now, you need to be at a pH of 7, preferably. So I'm ending with that particular note, except to point out this last paper, which has come from John Hartwig in uh, Champaign, Illinois, a homogeneous catalyst. I'm sure that Carmen sitting in the front row will be very pleased to hear about this. This is not a heterogeneous catalyst. It's for cutting a carbon-oxygen bond in lignins. And it's a very impressive paper. I didn't pick it up until a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm in the state now. You see, I don't run a large uh, group anymore. But I do have the luxury of being able to look at what other people are doing and trying to assess where their contributions fall in. Mr. President, I've talked for far too long. I hope I've not uh, wearied you with uh, no end of uh, irrelevancies, as it were. But some of the things, I hope, are highly relevant, and I hope that you have found it uh, as interesting to listen to as I have found it to give. So I thank you again for the invitation to be here, and I'm deeply honored to be a, a foreign fellow, a corresponding foreign fellow of your distinguished society. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.